Well, hello, Woodman, and Merry Christmas. I don't know if it's looking like it, but it certainly is feeling like it here because this wind is howling. First off, thank you to all of you who served yesterday to help us pull off 18 distinct services across our five campuses. We trust that God did great things and say to God be the glory for all that he did. You know, this is kind of special for me to, you know, be invited into your home. Maybe you're not watching it on Christmas Day, but the thought that you might be, and there's perhaps some wrapping paper, you know, spread about. Maybe it's later in the day and Christmas dinner is cooking in the kitchen. Or perhaps Uncle Jimmy started to pontificate again and you said, hey, why don't we watch church? Whatever it is that brings you to this point, thank you for letting me spend some time today with you and yours. I don't know if you've ever played that game, maybe in student ministry, bigger, better, best. Uh, you start with something like a paper clip and you go up to a door and you ask if they have anything bigger or better that they would be willing to trade you for. And then making that trade, you go on to the next house and try again. It occurred to me that sometimes, sometimes families hand out their gifts on Christmas morning much the same way. Uh, maybe it's a special vacation that's going to happen later in the new year. Uh, maybe it's the, the number one thing on their list. Moms and dads providentially work it that while kids can open some things, they always seem to end with the best. Do you guys do that in your families? Did you do that growing up? We've been looking at some of the promises that God made to his people and how the arrival of Jesus fulfilled them all. And as we celebrate the birth of Jesus this day, we want to look at the last big promise God made to his people, the best, a promise that would change everything. It's found in Jeremiah 31. And in verse 31, it begins with a little bit of a setup as Jeremiah sets the stage. We read, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah spoke these words to a dejected people. Israel and Judah had been exiled. They had broken God's covenant and now were paying the price. They knew they had messed up. And the question, the question is, what hope did they have? But even as they had failed, uh, God was going to keep the promises he made to Abram, the promise he made to Moses, and the promise he made to David. He had something new up his sleeve. He had a new covenant. While you see a new covenant speak, spoken of throughout the New Testament, this is the only place in the old that it's mentioned. And it's actually where the New Testament gets its name from. It begins with Jesus and it changes everything. We're going to read the whole thing together. Verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their heart, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more." After those days, that, that is these days, the birth of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection ushered in this new covenant. And Jeremiah highlights four things 
that we can specifically look forward to and enjoy now. And the first one is that God promises new life. He says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. Uh, those first set of laws, those 10 commandments were, were written on tablets of stone. They, they were external. And notice God isn't saying that he's giving them new laws, but God is telling them that he's putting his laws in a new place. He's putting them on hearts. Imagine traveling to a country, some foreign country where they, they speak a different language. Uh, that language would be external to you. Uh, you could learn it. It would probably take time. But even if you were to spend years and years there, uh, that language uh, would probably never become your heart language, the one that you were most comfortable with. That was the situation uh, the Israelites found themselves in when God gave them his laws. Uh, he told them to honor their parents, but they didn't always want to do that. Told them not to steal, but sometimes they wanted to. God's laws were external. They were not always the cry of their hearts, and consequently, they didn't come naturally to them. When someone comes to faith in Jesus, they go from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive, and one of the things that happens at that moment is that God writes his law on their hearts. And while that doesn't mean that we always follow it, there's a new desire that wasn't there before, and we feel convicted when we, feel sh when, we, when we fall short. That's something the ancient Israelites did not have. That's a significant upgrade we in Christ get to enjoy. But secondly, God promises renewed confidence. He says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is a total gift of grace. God had told them that they would be his people, but they left him. They abandoned him. And yet God here re-ups that promise of relationship and commits to them afresh. One of the sweetest parts of, of my role here at Woodman is being able to see firsthand relationships that had been severed, that become restored and at times even as good as new. Jesus promised this in John 10, 28. Jesus tells us that he will give us eternal life, tells us that we will never perish and that no one will snatch us out of his hand. We have a confidence that in Christ, even though we had failed, we have a confidence that goes beyond this earthly life and looking to eternity, we know that we know that we know we will be in relationship with him forever. The third one is that God promises new community. Verse 34 says, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Now, this is not saying, I think, thankfully, that I'm to be unemployed, that no one needs any teachers anymore. Uh, there are still those in the new covenant called to be teachers of God's people. What it is saying is twofold. First, in, in the new covenant, uh, there's no longer any need for an intermediary between us and God. Uh, we don't need a Moses to go up, talk to God, find out what he's saying, come back and report. Through Christ, we each have access in one spirit to the Father. Uh, you don't need Moses. You don't need Elijah. You don't need a Josh. You, through Christ, can go directly to him, and he welcomes you. Secondly, though, under the new covenant, you had people who were wearing the jersey but cheering for the other team. Uh, the faithful remnant of God's people were always exhorting and challenging and trying to get others to get on board. In the new covenant, 
we who are in Christ, everyone who is called upon the name of Jesus, whether insignificant in the world's eyes or the most important, each of us become equal members of the body of Christ, this new community. You may be celebrating this Christmas with family and friends. And for whatever reason, uh, feel like you, you don't belong there. When we confess Christ as Lord, we are adopted as sons and daughters of God Almighty and made part of the body of Christ, his church. Uh, you belong to his family. And finally, and profoundly, in the new covenant, God promises total forgiveness. He writes, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Under the old covenant, there was always opportunity for the forgiveness of sins. Animals could be sacrificed and sins atoned for. Problem was, people would sin again and more animals would have to die. In the new covenant, God will remember our sin no more. Not that he forgets them, but that through Jesus, he no longer holds our sins against us. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we are cleansed of all of our iniquity. And because he was the perfect sacrifice, when God looks at you and I who are in Christ, he only sees the spotless righteousness of Jesus. Now, relationship with Jesus doesn't mean we will never stumble, but that our stumbles will never ruin the relationship we have with him. It's, it's like me and Christmas dinner. Every year I do my Christmas steaks, which are glorious, by the way. But every year I have a little bit of trepidation that maybe I'll, I'll mess them up. Because we celebrate with family and friends that I like and generally like me, <laughs> even if this year later on they don't turn out, I'm not worried. I mean, they're family. They're not going to skip Christmas next year because of my mistake on this one. Much more profound, God cleanses us of all of our iniquities and does not hold them against us, ever. For Jeremiah's listeners, they had to wait. Like children weeks ago, leading up to Christmas. But for you and me, the gift has come and it is ready to be opened. I wonder if, if that's how you need to respond today. Or perhaps you would be content to leave this gift under the tree. If you have questions about some of this stuff, I bet there could very well be people in the room you're watching with that would love to talk to you about it. Or you could certainly reach out to us and we would love to share. We each need to confess Christ as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead for the forgiveness of our sins and this new life that he has promised us. Or perhaps you are like me and you opened this gift years ago. I wonder if you would take a moment and consider whatever it is that you found under that tree this day, uh, whatever it is that will happen to you in the year ahead, nothing will ever compare to what Jesus did on our behalf by putting on flesh and dwelling among us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. In these next moments together, we are going to sing some of the songs we love so well, knit our hearts to his. Before that, allow me to pray and we will worship 
together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this greater promise, this new covenant that in you we can have new life, a renewed confidence, new community, and the forgiveness of sins. Lord, I pray that for those of us who know you by faith this morning, would we rejoice and relish in that truth. And perhaps, God, would this be a day of salvation when our loved ones or friends embrace what it is we have found in the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Well, I hope that you have enjoyed our time together. And I don't know if you're going to dinner, if you're gonna watch a football game, I don't know what is next, but I want you to know, we are excited about the things God is doing in our church and would look forward to have you participating with us in the new year ahead. This coming weekend, we begin a new series entitled Rest Assured, looking at the gospel of Luke and the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We would love to have you be a part, not just next weekend, but every weekend as we march towards Easter. So, from my family to yours, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Merry Christmas.